We're all glad to be here this morning, I'm sure. We can feel the blessing of being able to meet together on this first day of the week, on the Lord's Day, to worship God together, and in the process to be encouraged ourselves. As you also know, we were in the process of considering a special study throughout the course of this year on heaven, based upon the hymn that John led for us at the very first uh, Sunday of the year, maybe at some point during this lesson, he led the song, Oh, think of the home over there. So we're going to think about the home over there. We're going to think about heaven throughout this year and hopefully be encouraged and our hope and our faith increase in our study and observation of what the Bible says about heaven. Coincidentally and happily, the ladies and this decision was made before we announced the theme of this special study, are studying a book in the ladies' class class that is based on heaven. And so that's a nice coincidence to work out well as we continue to learn from different uh, sources, sermons, books and articles, special studies, and so forth, that we'll be conducting on the theme of heaven. In keeping with that theme, we're going to continue the lesson today that we started last week. If you will recall last Sunday I preached a lesson that was based upon a survey that was taken concerning questions that worldly people for the most part came up with regarding heaven. And uh, those questions were, some of them at least, sort of sophomoric or immature based upon a uh, lack of knowledge really of the Bible. And they were, is heaven in the clouds? Another question we considered, will heaven be plain white? Do we become angels in heaven? Will we have wings in heaven? Will we lose our physical senses, the sense of taste, hear, smell, touch, and so forth, when we're in heaven? Will heaven be filled with nerves and prudes? Many people consider religious people to be nerds and prudes sometimes. Another question, will we recognize loved ones in heaven? Will there be sadness over lost loved ones when we get to heaven? Will shame keep us from enjoying heaven? And then finally, will heaven be boring? So some of those were good questions some of which we'll be considering yet today. But our lesson today is based upon questions that you came up with. You recall last Sunday morning I handed out some little sheets of paper and asked everyone to write down at least one question or one or more questions about heaven that you would like to have answered, that you would like to have more information on or you'd like to discuss. So we did that and uh, I really enjoyed going over these questions and I will seek to answer them this morning. So if you wrote one of these questions last week and handed it in, we will be considering it this morning. The first question we're going to deal with is, what will it be like? What will heaven be like? There was another question, similar to that one, what will heaven look like? So we'll answer both of these questions simultaneously this morning and consider them as pretty much being the basically same question. What will heaven be like? What will heaven look like? Well, I don't think there's any doubt just from what we know about heaven from the descriptions in the Bible that it is going to be a beautiful place. Heaven is going to be beautiful far beyond anything we can even comprehend now. We haven't even seen the beauty of heaven yet. As beautiful as this, as this earth is, we have natural wonders in this earth, in this own country, the Grand Canyon, uh, Yellowstone Park, and different national parks scattered throughout every part of this nation. Every geographical area has beautiful landscapes and beautiful aspects with regard to the creation that God gave us. But yet we are told in uh, Acts 7 verse 49, that this earth is a footstool of God's feet. If this beautiful earth upon which we live is a footstool of God's feet, <coughs> what 
will the throne of God look like? It has to be even far surpassing the beauty of this physical earth. We must understand from such passages as Ezekiel chapter 1 and verse 4, which says, Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and brightness was all around it. And radiating out of its midst was a color of amber out of the midst of the fire. This is a description of God. If you've never read Ezekiel chapter 1, where Ezekiel gives us his vision of God. This is part of his vision of God and God's throne. And take time to read that when you have a chance. The entire chapter, verses 1 through verse 28, is a description of God and what heaven is going to look like. It's wonderful. It's beautiful, it's powerful, it's amazing. It's, he uses word pictures here that create a powerful yet beautiful image of heaven. It's amazing in its aspect. It is verses 26 through 28 of this chapter. And above the firmament, he goes on after verse one, after verse 4 that we read a minute ago and talks about the four living creatures. And as you go through the Old and New Testaments, you're going to read a lot about the four living creatures in heaven, all the way from this passage to the book of Revelation, the four living creatures that are in heaven around the throne of God are mentioned. And after he does that, he then talks about the spirit and the will within the will that is depicted here. And then it says in verse 26, and above the firmament, over their heads, that is over the heads of the uh, the four creatures was the likeness of the throne. In appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw as it were the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance and the likeness of the glory of the Lord. That's Ezekiel's impression of what this heavenly vision looked like as he observed and describe God in the throne under which God reigns. Beautiful, powerful, amazing, frightening even, but wonderful. In Revelation chapter 4, again we can see yet further descriptions of heaven that use the same type of language describing for us what heaven will look like. Again, awesome power, beauty, worship, 24 elders falling down and worshiping at the feet of God. Again, you see the four living creatures. They're worshiping God as well. And in chapter 5, as you move on, you see the land being introduced. In verses 1 through 6, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside, and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of his right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then all the elders and the four living creatures, thousands upon thousands of them, tens of thousands and ten thousands, said out with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who is slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth 
and such as are in the city, and all that are in them, I heard say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and forever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. All worship God. All worship the Lamb. Heaven is a place of beauty, is a place of all inspiring power and magnificence. It is a place where the glory of God fills the realm. And it is a place where we worship and bow down together as we worship God and Jesus Christ, of course, who is the Lamb. Many of them go to Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. Further description of this new Jerusalem, this heavenly city, this place that we anticipate and plan preparing ourselves to be in at the end of our life when Jesus comes again. Here in Revelation 21, beginning of verse 9, it says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, stood up with the seven last plagues, came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride and the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and twelve angels at the gates, and the name written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Then the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. Then it goes on, if it's kicked down to verse 19, the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation of Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth Chrysophras, the eleventh Jacinth, and the twelfth Amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the strength of the city was pure gold, and transparent as glass. We can go on to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, and other passages as well. Talking about how heaven is described here. What is heaven? What will it be like? It's going to be awesome beyond our comprehension, beyond anything we can even conceive of. I think these terms that are used to describe heaven for us in the book of Revelation are geared to our ability to understand beautiful things that are physical in nature. But I think the beauty of the spiritual abode of heaven is going to be far grander, far more marvelous, far more beautiful than even these beautiful stones and jewels that he describes heaven with here in this context. So what will heaven be like? What will heaven look like? It will be the most beautiful, awesome sight that we have ever beheld, more so than anything we view here upon this earth. Question number two. Will we be able to appreciate the beauty of heaven? Will we be able to appreciate the beauty of heaven? Let me keep these organized. I'll probably do that today. Well, I think the answer is yes. We will be able to appreciate the beauty of heaven. If we can appreciate God here upon this earth, we just read a rather lengthy passage from Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. Talking about the, the glory of God and how worthy the land is of our worship, bowing down before Him. Can we appreciate God for the blessings He's given us here upon this earth? Can we appreciate the spiritual blessings that we read about in the Word of God and that we enjoy in our life as God's children? If we can appreciate God and all His blessings, then we can appreciate heaven. Heaven and God are often words that are used synonymously. For example, in Luke chapter 15 and verse 18, 
When the prodigal son comes back and he says, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned before God. Those are references to the same entity, the same deity. Heaven is used synonymously with God in that context. And we see that often in the Word of God, where heaven is sometimes a reference to God or to deity. And it's used there likewise in Luke 15 and verse 18. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, in what we call the Lord's Prayer, which is really the disciples' prayer, it says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on heaven as it is on earth. When we think of heaven, we think of God and God reigning there and our need to obey and do God's will within that context. Deuteronomy chapter 26 and verse 15 refers to heaven as God's holy habitation. Deuteronomy 26 and verse 15, heaven is described there as God's holy habitation. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1 beginning, the Apostle Paul describes how someone he knows, he's speaking of himself in third person there, who went to the third heaven, which is the throne of God, where God dwelt. And he said that he saw there unspeakable things, things were so glorious and so magnificent that he couldn't speak about them. And in order to keep him from boasting about that, God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. Because if you'd gone to heaven and seen what Paul said, or what Paul said he saw in that vision, you'd boast about it. You wouldn't brag about it. I've been there. I've seen it. And God gave him a thorn in the flesh to subdue his bragging. Also, so I think we can know that we will appreciate heaven if we can appreciate God. His glory, His magnificence, His power, His blessings. But we can also say that we will appreciate the beauty of heaven if we appreciate the beauty of this earth. If we can appreciate the beauty of this earth, I think we will much appreciate the beauty of heaven. And we will recognize how wonderful heaven is. Even more so because it will be greater than the beauty of this earth. And I'm sure we can all appreciate the beauty of the beautiful scenes of this earth. Some of us like to travel out west and see the great national parks, or maybe even the northeast, all over the country, really. And for those of you who may have traveled overseas, there are beautiful scenes all over the world that God has created for us, and we appreciate those. Well, if we do, we'll appreciate heaven even more so. Along with that question that I just referred to, when it says, will you be able, will we be able to appreciate the view? There was also a second question. Will we recognize others? That's the second question on that one sheet that somebody handed in. Will we recognize others when we get to heaven? And I think that was actually asked twice. Someone asked, will we recognize each other? Or will we recognize others when we get to heaven? I think again the question is answered yes. Remember when Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration of Jesus, when Moses and Elijah appeared before them, men who had been dead for centuries, and they appeared to Peter, James, and John, and apparently they recognized them. Because Peter said, Let's build a tabernacle here for you, speaking of Christ and also for Moses and Elijah. So they recognized, it's implied that they recognized Moses and Elijah, who were apparently in paradise at the time, awaiting heaven. And that's in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 4. The Apostle John, as we read there from Revelation chapter 4 and 5 again, he recognized, was able to identify God and Jesus Christ the Lamb. In that vision that he saw of heaven, he recognized God on his throne and the Lamb of God. The rich man recognized Lazarus in Luke chapter 16. You know, we're all familiar with the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And he recognized Abraham. He recognized Lazarus there in paradise. He knew these things and he was able to recognize them. Stephen again, 
looked into heaven there just before he was stoned to death. He saw the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God, Acts chapter 7 and verse 56. He was able to see into heaven that miraculous view that he had of heaven just before he died. He was able to see into heaven and he saw the Son of Man, Jesus that is, standing at the right hand of God. So he asked, will we recognize others in heaven? Will we recognize each other? I think the answer is yes. The implications are. We don't have any details beyond what I just described for you from the Word of God, but it certainly implies that we will recognize other people in heaven. We will not lose that ability. The next question, will we get to heaven as soon as we, we die? Uh, <clears throat> will we get to heaven as soon as we die? I'm going to come back to that question in just a minute. So hang on. The next question after that is, will we know of friends or family that are not there? Question about heaven. Will we know of friends or family that are not there? Well, again, we go back to Luke chapter 16. And we take a look at the rich man. As a matter of fact, I'm not going to turn back there. We'll probably be referring to, to uh, Luke chapter 16 and what Jesus says here. And this is not called a parable here. In Luke chapter 16, it's not introduced as a parable. It's introduced as something that actually happened. It's introduced to us as reality. So we consider again from verses 19 through 31 there. I'm not going to take the time to read it. But the rich man saw Abraham. He also recognized Lazarus. He remembered his five brothers who were still living on the earth. So the question, when we know of any friends or family that are not there. And I believe, based on Luke chapter 16, the answer is yes. Based on the rich man being able to recognize Abraham, he recognized Lazarus. He also remembered his five brothers. He spoke about his five brothers. And he was apparently also familiar with Moses and the prophets. Because Abraham, who speaks to him in this uh, context, refers to Moses and the prophets which I think the uh, rich man knew about. In verse 27 it says, Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, Father Abraham he's referring to here, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So he was familiar with Moses and the prophets. He did not obey them, obviously, but uh, he was familiar with them. And he was cognizant of his brothers that were not there with him. So I think that answers the question. Will we know of any friends or family that are not there? Well, the rich man knew about his brothers that were not there, and he feared they would probably never be in heaven, at least not in paradise. And he was asking Abraham to send Lazarus back to warn my brothers. If somebody comes back from the dead, they'll believe that person. But the next question is, will we get to heaven as soon as we die? Will we get to heaven as soon as we die? As soon as we know, you hear that all the time. People are constantly saying, you know, so-and-so is in heaven. If you're a Rush Limbaugh fan, you know that he died last week, maybe a week and a half ago. And, uh, you heard a lot of people say in reference to his death, well, he's in heaven now. He's in a better place. He's in heaven. I heard everybody say that. 
They had a lot of different co-hosts on the show that filled in, and different news con uh, people who were conservative, uh, they often said that. And you hear all the people say that at funerals, for example. You hear people say, well, they're in heaven now. Is that true? Well, again, we go back to Luke chapter 16. You may already be there in your Bible. Will we have any sort of record? Let's see. Let me back up. Will we get to heaven as soon as we die? Well, there in Luke chapter 16, Lazarus and the rich man died. And it says there, in verse 22, So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Well, that sounds like that was pretty immediate, doesn't it? That they went to this place where Lazarus was in paradise, and the rich man was in torment, and it seems as if it happened immediately after they died. But we're going to spend a minute on this to point out that where they went is a place that has two different sections, two distinct sections. That place is Hades. It's made up of paradise and torment. Hades means that which is not seen, or the abode of the dead. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament word, word Sheol. Or, a, yes, Sheol. And that is defined as a place where the dead exists. It is described in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 as a destination of those who die. And that's an interesting passage. You'll have to turn to Revelation chapter 20. Where we have a discussion here, a description of the great white throne judgment. The judgment of the great white throne. It says there, Then I saw a great white throne and him sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into this lake of fire. So there ultimately, after this great white throne of judgment, is described the second death. So by that we can imply that there must have been a first death. The first death would be physical death, which puts a person in Hades. And that's exactly what's said here in verse 13, concerning all the dead who are rising. He talks about the dead in the sea and the dead in the graves and so on and so forth. And because some people died at sea, some people died on the land and so on and so forth. But ultimately they ended up in the same place that's known as Hades. Verse 13 then says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. So before the final judgment, before people who are evil going to the second death, which is eternal damnation. Gehenna is a word there describing that. There's a place called Hades. Hades gave up her dead. They were judged, and then they go into hell if they're evil. That's what Revelation 20 uh, and verse uh, 15 is about, the ones who died in faith. But the same judgment and resurrection pertains to those who are Thankful as well, over in John chapter 5, for example, in verses 28 beginning, it says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, or the second death, 
and cast into the lake of fire, or Gehenna, which is a reference to eternal damnation. So there you have a description that's parallel with what we read there in Revelation chapter 20, in reference to the judgment of the great white throne and the eternal damnation of those who were uh, coming out of Hades. So Hades is the destination of the wicked. That is the destination of everyone who dies the first death. Then they will come out of that for judgment and into eternal heaven or eternal damnation. In Psalm chapter 16, David wrote a messianic psalm there that has to do with this same content and the same idea that we're talking about. Turn to Psalm chapter 16 and I can tell very quickly that we're not going to be able to finish, but about half of these uh, questions that are laid out, but I will get to all of them at some point in a later lesson, maybe uh, maybe even next Sunday. But here in Psalm 16, uh, where David, in verses 9 and 10, writes a messianic song. He says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. So here he talked about, seems to be talked about his own soul, his own body. That you will not leave my soul in Sheol. But of course, Sheol and uh, Hades are the same word. Sheol is the Hebrew, and Hades is the Greek translation of that. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, over in Acts chapter 2, when Peter's preaching the first gospel sermon here, in which 3,000 people converted to Christ, he says there, beginning in verse 25, he quotes Psalm 16. He says, For David says concerning him, David says concerning Christ, Christ is under consideration here in this lesson. And he says, quoting Psalm 16, 8, beginning, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So he's quoting what David said in Psalm 16, where he says, You will not leave my soul in Hades. But men and brethren, he says in verse 29, Let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseen this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So there again you know Jesus died. He was buried in the tomb. Over his time his soul went to Hades. And but after three days he was resurrected. And he of course eventually ascended into heaven, but not in the same way that you and I will. He being deity in the flesh was able to be resurrected from the dead, and spent 40 days with his disciples, appearing to them, proving that he was indeed the Son of God, that his resurrection took place, and it was indeed miraculous. And he went into heaven, he ascended into heaven on that cloud, so he's there in heaven, where we wish to be. But he went to Hades first. Another passage to turn to, in answer to the question, when we get to heaven as soon as we die, we would turn to Luke 23 and verse 43, where Jesus said to the thief on the cross that died with him, Today you will be with me in paradise. And we've already pointed out that paradise is one of the two sections of Hades, where Lazarus and the rich man both were. In these two sections of Hades, where the dead people go before judgment and before the resurrection. And he says to that thief today, not tomorrow, not at the second coming of Christ, not on the day of judgment, today you will be with me in paradise, 
And that's where Jesus was when he died and was there for three days until his body and his soul rejoined in the resurrection. So all these pastors talk about the fact that we do not go directly to heaven when we die. With the first death, the separation of our soul from our body, our soul will go to Hades. Hopefully it will be paradise rather than torment. And we will there be awaiting the day of judgment. When we be resurrected and then join Jesus in the air, you can also turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18, and read in that process of how those who are, who've died will be resurrected from Hades. It doesn't say Hades, but it says they will be resurrected. And then we who are still living, when Christ comes, will meet them and meet Jesus in the air and uh, usher them to heaven eventually. So that is the uh, first five of the uh, questions that I present to you that you gave to me, seeking to answer them. We'll continue, as I mentioned, because our time is up. We'll have to come back and answer the rest later on. But let me point out as we conclude the, uh, the sermon. The heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And if we wish to be in heaven with God, to enjoy this hope that's laid up for us, as heaven is a prime in Colossians chapter 1 verse 5, heaven is a hope that's laid up for us. We all, all hopefully are, are desiring and expecting, that is hoping, to be in heaven when this life is over. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 again tells us that if we want to make it to heaven, if you want to have that hope of heaven, then we need to seek those things which are God. Seek those heavenly, godly principles of love, faith, repentance, obedience, submission to God. And if there's any among our number this morning that need to subject yourself to this Almighty God, whose power we observed a few moments ago from Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4, we encourage you to come forward this morning, repent of your sins, ask God to forgive you, so you can look forward and have that hope of heaven for this life is over. If you need to come forward for that purpose, please do so now, as together we stand and as we stand.